So Charles Mayer said that you could smell a durian from across a crowded market. Now Charles Mayer had spent several decades traveling and working between Singapore and Malaya, British Malaya, the turn of the 20th century, the age of empire. But it took him eight years to try this fruit, the durian. It was a fruit whose odor, he said, is particularly disgusting for Western nostrils. Some of you are trying it. Most of you can smell it. This is a multi-sensory TED talk. Tentatively, though, nose tightly squeezed, just like those folks in the front row, they, he finally tasted that pale yellow flesh in its brown spiked shell. It took him a while to learn to like the taste. He had words for it. He described it as a mixture of cream, banana, chocolate, garlic, all mixed together. <laughs> what he was doing, to give you a sense of the fruit here, he was translating for the American palate, the taste of the tropics. He conquered his revulsion, conquered a word that we'll come back to. And he would write years later that writing of it now fills me with a longing to eat durian. Durian's a strange fruit. It certainly is. But when you think about it, it's not a lot stranger than fruits that you eat all the time. How about the yellow, vaguely phallic banana? Or an equally spiky pineapple with its frilly, rough top. But they had different histories, and that's part of why the durian matters so much. Pineapples and bananas became the stuff of big companies. Chiquita Brands, which was once United Fruit Company, and Dole Pineapple effectively ruled their own colonies. They were the things that made the U.S. empire. Pineapples, if you've ever passed a cast iron fence, pineapples are there. The little decoration at the top, look closely. You'll find pineapples everywhere. Durian's different. Durian never did become the stuff of big imperial companies. But in 2013 in Richmond, British Columbia, a 911 call cleared a local shopping mall. The caller warned of a gas leak. It was a durian, in fact, <laughs> for sale in an Asian supermarket. The news reports called it, quote, a cultural misunderstanding. <laughs> cultural misunderstanding about fruit? It makes us wonder why fruit matters so much and why durian matters. It, why it matters for how we understand the age of empire. The fruit matters because the people and animals of Malaya and the rest of Southeast Asia loved the durian so much. They loved it so much that American tourists to the region noticed it. The durian, I'm arguing, becomes that spiny site where indigenous tastes and American distaste and suspicion clashed. There's an encounter around the durian you're experiencing now as I see the tray pass from row to row and not many of you trying it. <laughs> Everything about the durian encapsulated in the sensorium, something deep and profound about empire itself. Conquest, the way in which difference gets articulated and the careful hidden ways colonized people talk back. Now many of you are able to smell the durian now. Think about how you're smelling it and how you're describing it. 
There's lots of ways we can understand smells. My friends in the world of science have their own explanations for why the durian smells. There are volatile compounds, sulfur, ketones. I'm sure you were all thinking that. There are also biological explanations. In 1949, the British biologist E.J.H. Corner came up with the famous durian tree theory that argued that the durian, or at least its equally smelly ancestors, developed this oversized shell and the ripe, pungent fruit in order to attract animals, animals that would eat the fruit, transport it, replant it, and fertilize it with their bowels. But we in the humanities have our own historical explanations about the ways in which people distinguish between aromas, which are good, and stench, which is bad, between ripeness, which we like, and rottenness, which we toss out with the trash. So what I'm asking about the durian is what kind of stories did it allow American travelers in Malaya to tell about social, racial, and cultural difference? Americans all went to try a durian when they were in Malaya, culinary tourism, and many came back with a postcard like this one from the 1920s. Europeans had first encountered and described the durian as far back as the 15th century, and the noted evolutionary theorist a few centuries later, Alfred Russell Wallace, in his botanical adventures in the Malay archipelago, described his experience with the durian. To eat durians, he noted, is a new sensation worthy of a voyage to the East to experience. It had become a tourist attraction for Wallace, and that's exactly my point. Empire, when we think about it, most of the time we think about empire as an experiment in political control and economic exploitation, in particular the extraction of natural resources. But it's more than that. Empire is also a kind of tourism. And tourism is more than just seeing sights. It's leisure, sometimes business travel, that creates intensely charged relations between transitory visitors and natives. Tourism is also culinary. Culinary tourism, a phrase coined by the food studies scholar Lucy Long. Tourism, in her words, is eating the other. And we do this all the time. Think about your own experiences. At the table, we shape difference as we eat strange, often repulsive foods. William and Lucille Mann ate their first durian in their trips to Malaya in the 1930s. Durian eating for the Manns, as for many others, was a rite of passage, an immersion in local culture. Let me give you a similarity. It's like leaving the all-inclusive resort when you're down in the tropics, heading Pepto-Bismol in hand for the cafe where the natives eat, and feeling damn proud of yourself when you come out. And that's what the mans did. They were delighted. They bought the postcard. But how we smell. Now, I want you to think carefully about what was going through your mind when you're smelling this durian. We describe smells in different kinds of ways. Sometimes we use adjectives, spicy, sweet. But we also use metaphors. And that's part of the point that I want to make. When people talked about the durian, they typically used metaphors. And as we will see, they used approximately the same metaphors. What are metaphors? What well, claiming a fruit is like or has the taste of something similar is a of something familiar is a kind of domestication. So many of you were saying to yourself, what does this fruit taste like? Well, it tastes like eggs or it tastes like onions or cheese. You're taking something strange and exotic and making it familiar again. I'm arguing that in the context of empire, that's a process of domestication. A process that seizes that fruit, it remains of the East, but understandable 
to the West. It's no more a process of domestication, no less a process of domestication than how you come up with hybrid types of bananas that make them able to be transported to America. The tourist A.B. Morse found the essential difference between East and West in the taste of the durian. Listen to his words. This is the most delicious of the delicious, the concentrated, sublimated quintessence of deliciousness. I know you're thinking that. But only, he wrote, to the native taste. For the Americans, it tasted of antiquated eggs, rotting fish, sauerkraut, all together. And yet the durian remained essential to the tourist experience. William Beebe had gone to Malaya to try and find the Argus pheasants, these strange birds, beautiful birds, that he wrote had never yet been seen alive by white men. It was also a journey of culinary tourism. As he got off the rickety bus from Kuala Lumpur, up in the mountains and jungles of Malaya, he went in search of something to eat crunching on the tiny bones of Mongolian finches and hummingbirds. He felt that he was, at last, in his words, on the threshold of a strange expedition. He then went to go and try the durian. And he failed, like so many of you. He couldn't eat it. He did find a comparison to something familiar, the metaphors and similes. He said that it tasted like sour milk, mixed with Limburger cheese. But he also recognized that tasting something strange would make him somehow better. Tasting, he wrote, is an achievement, a growth of ego. Think how good you feel when you've gone to that cafe outside of the all-inclusive. But it was also conquest, overcoming revulsion to become akin to the native. But it was also, he said, a mortification of the organs of smell. Remember that, we're going to come back to it. He wished he had eaten that durian. I should enjoy being able to boast, he lamented. I have eaten durian in the East. Mortification. It's an interesting word that tells us something more about the ways in which we describe smell. The ways in which it becomes a judgment on people who do love the durian and for whom it's so important culturally, economically, nutritionally. We can find an explanation for that word mortification in the work of the sociologist Uri Almagor, who described a kind of cycle of smells. Aromas, what we like, are things that are ripe, maturing. Think about how much you love the smell of ripe raspberries but you don't like the smell of rotting raspberries. You throw them away as fast as you can. Decay, stench, effluence, pollution. We don't like those smells. We like the smell of ripe. But when people described mortification of the senses or rotten onions or antiquated eggs, they had made the durian rotting. It could never be, in the American imagination, ripe. It could only be rotting. And yet, its attraction was undeniable. It was undeniable not just to people that they encountered in the Malay Peninsula, but as well, animals. And in that connection, they were able to find something else that they would describe as key, as essential to the character of the Malay people. Indeed, they would describe it as a racial trait. They described it as a phrase that you all use all the time, running amok. You all know the phrase. Running amok, amok, in fact, comes from a Malay word imported into English to describe a moment of savagery, revision to animalness, a momentary violent madness. And this American observer said is exactly what happens when natives ate durian. Durian season was a time of running amok in which the essential racial character of the Malay was revealed, or so the American racial imagination went. 
Mayer never quite forgot the linguistic origins of the term running amok, and he cast running amok as that essential Malay trait, a savagery that linked, lurked below the surface until the durian fell. The great outdoorsman, Casper Whitney, would say that the durian brings great madness of conflict upon those that taste its passion-stirring flavor. Durian made them seem like animals, and indeed, so many descriptions insist that natives and animals all craved the durian to the point of irrational infatuation. Listen to Whitney again. At the height of the durian season, all animal kind in Malay, two-legged and four-legged, is animated by an insatiable lust for the fruit itself. Running amok to fill the savage anger, he continued, against whatever stands in the way of satisfying its appetite, all durian-eating Malay, man and beast, are aflame with erotic character. All this about a stinky fruit. But this tells us something about the experience of culinary tourism, one side of it, and you can see it in the words of people like Whitney. The ways in which eating the strange, eating the other, gives you a sense of adventure, power, ego, amusement, and disdain. There's another side to it, too. It's that discomfort, the niggling feeling at the back of your neck that you're being watched as you try strange food. And Americans knew, as they tried their durian, that not only were they being watched, they were being judged, and they were being laughed at by the native. The act of tasting represented a very brief, a very fleeting, passing moment when even in the context of empire, with all its inequalities, that Westerners felt as strangers, outsiders, weak, fallible, in the face of the tropics and all that it offered. Durian eating was a chance for natives to laugh openly. Mayer recalled his first time eating the durian. A group of natives gathered round me, Mayer recalled, laughing at my grimaces. There was and there continues to be a kind of tug of war over the stories that we tell about durian. For some, it's a delicious fruit. Indeed, it has become widely commercialized, but not by Western companies. You could buy this durian as I did at a local supermarket imported all the way from Thailand. But it can also be that strange fruit that reminds the West that the East is still part of the jungle. We relish, and I use the word deliberately, the stories about how durian is not allowed on the Singapore subway. Anthony Bourdain, that archetypical culinary tourist, also made sure that he fit durian eating into his televised culinary tourism. He described durian eating to, quote, French kissing your dead grandmother. <laughs> it's an insult so profound in its racism that it makes you yearn for the turn of the century imperial traveler. Chef Andrew Zimmerman also put the durian in, on his culinary trail. And he used words that come directly from the early 20th century. The fruit tasted to him as, quote, completely mushy, rotten onions. In those descriptions, in their continuity, in the license that Bourdain felt to say something so deeply and profoundly disrespectful, we find proof positive in aroma at least, that the colonial exotic exists even in the context of today's Asian urban modernity. Thanks. <laughs>